Morning. Anybody else sick here? If you're at home, you can raise your hand too. So I'm struggling with a, with a bout of pneumonia. So you're going to have to really pay attention today uh, because I'll be, I won't be my normal, uh, dramatic, loud self. So just hang with me. And if I, uh, if I get into trouble, I actually have a, a designated scripture reader to come up and help me today. But uh, I'm, I apologize ahead of time that I'm going to be manipulating a, a cough drop in my mouth while we're here today. So forgiveness ahead is great. Hey, thanks for being here on a day when, you're, when your uh, clock um, would have put you at the wrong time. Of course, we all have cell phones now, and they're all self-adjusting. So, but glad you're here. This morning, we're going to be looking at the uh, 26th chapter of Matthew. 26th chapter of Matthew begins the passion of Christ. What does that word mean? I mean, we use that term when we talk about the passion of the Christ. And really, it comes from a Greek word uh, that means suffering. And Jesus uses this word to describe what he must do. The Son of Man must go and suffer many things. So Jesus applies this own term to himself. And in its fullest sense, it means um, immense physical suffering, immense emotional suffering, an intense spiritual struggle all together. So as we look at the passion of the Christ and Jesus approaching the cross, these three aspects come into play. And so today as we read through this chapter, it's going to be more of an observation than a preaching session today, and more of an extended meditation than a lecture, because we're reading through part of Jesus' last few days on earth and him approaching the cross. And so we're, we want to experience the passion today together, start to experience that, what it means to us, because Jesus, the Messiah, the Savior of the world, is giving himself for us. So let's pray together. Lord, thank you for letting us be in this place. Thank you that we can rely on you in all things. We ask that as we look at the life of Jesus as he approaches the cross today, that you would help us, that you would help us to be better followers of Christ, we pray in your name. Amen. Amen. We're going to go through this in nine sections. The first is the plot against Jesus. When Jesus had finished saying all these things, he said to his disciples, you know, the Passover is two days away and the Son of Man will be handed over to be crucified. Then the chief priests and the elders of the people assembled in the palace of the high priest, whose name was Caiaphas, and they plotted to arrest Jesus in some sly way and kill him. But not during the feast, they said, or there may be a riot among the people. You know, when Jesus had finished his teachings on the Mount of Olives and answering his disciples' questions about the end of days, he tells them for the sixth time in the book of Matthew, that he must die, that he must go to the cross. He started to tell him about six months ago very clearly what he needed to do. And notice now, Jesus himself sets the time for his own death. He says in two days. And you notice what, the, what our scripture text told us is that his enemies did not want to kill him during the time of Passover because they, they were afraid a riot would break out. But you see, even in the end, as he approaches the cross, Jesus is in control, and he's the one who sets the timing for his own execution. Never miss the fact that Jesus is in control. It's a great lesson for us. Let's go on. Jesus anointed at Bethany. While Jesus was in Bethany, in the home of a man known as Simon the leper, a woman came to him with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume, which she poured on his head as he was reclining at the table. When the disciples saw this, they were indignant. Why this waste, they had, they asked. This perfume could have been sold at a high price and the money given to the poor. Aware of this, Jesus said to them, Why are you bothering this woman? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you, but you will not always have me. When she poured this perfume on my body, she did it to prepare me for burial. I'll tell you the truth. 
wherever the gospel is preached throughout the world, which he has done will also be told in memory of her. You know, this is a beautiful story as Jesus approaches the cross. John chapter 12 tells us this woman is Mary, the sister of Martha. And they're at the home of this guy, Simon the leper, who's probably a former leper that Jesus, that Jesus healed. Jesus is the guest of honor, and he comes in and sits down, and Mary enters the room with this alabaster container of expensive perfume. The container was made in such a way that it actually had to be broken so that the spice, so that the perfume would come out. Scripture identifies this, per- this perfume as spikenard, which is extremely expensive. And the estimations are that this little jar was probably worth 300 denarii, which was the, the equivalent of a full year's wage. For Mary, who probably lived at home, this represented the most expensive thing she had, her most prized possession, and it was probably her dowry for her wedding. And yet, she takes this, and she breaks it, and she anoints Jesus. And it was customary to wash the feet and anoint the head of guests in those days. But she comes in and goes above and beyond. John, John adds the detail that when Mary anoints Jesus with this, with this perfume, with this nard, she actually washes his feet, wipes his feet with her hair. See, to let the aroma out, the jar had to be broken. And it, one of the disciples says, it's a waste. This could have been spent on the poor. And by the way, Scripture tells us in one of the other Gospels that the person who objected was Judas. Mary, Mary anoints Jesus, and Jesus says, she did this to prepare me for burial. Now, if we fast forward to the end of, of, of uh, Matthew, on the resurrection day, you remember that the women go to the go to the tomb to anoint Jesus for burial. That's what it says. So those women, when they got to the tomb, Jesus wasn't there. He had already risen from the dead. And in fact, Mary is the only one who got to anoint Jesus for his death. What an honor. Jesus said the story of her faithfulness would be told forever. What story is told about your faithfulness or mine? What stories will people tell about us? I love the fact that when Mary wiped Jesus' feet with her hair, she walked away smelling like Jesus. Do we have the aroma of Christ in our own lives? Next section is Judas agrees to betray Jesus. Then one of the twelve, one called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priest and asked, what are you willing to give me if I hand him over to you? So they counted out for him 30 silver coins. From then on, Judas watched for an opportunity to hand him over. You know, if you're a literary person, you're familiar with Dante's Inferno. Dante says the lowest section of hell is assigned to Judas and also Brutus, the one who betrayed Caesar. Those are the guys at the bottom level. Zechariah 11 prophesies the exact amount of 30 pieces of silver to betray Christ. And betrayal is the lowest act of a friend. And Judas initiates this, and we, hear, we read in one of the other Gospels, he's actually possessed by Satan. And the chief priests and teachers were delighted. The timing needed to be when the crowd was not around. Isn't that exactly when we betray Christ in our own lives? We don't like to betray him when everybody's around. We pick times when we're on our own. Pick times when we're off doing something else. Judas was no different. For Judas, it was money. What is it for you? The Last Supper, the Lord's Supper. On the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, where do you want us to make preparations for you to eat the Passover? He replied, go to a city of a certain man and tell him, the teacher says my appointed time is near. I'm going to celebrate the Passover with my disciples at your house. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them and prepared the Passover. When evening came, Jesus was reclining at a table with the twelve, and while they were eating them, he said, I tell you the truth, one of you will betray me. They were very sad and began to ask him one after the other, Surely not I, Lord. Jesus replied, The one who has dipped his hand into the bowl with me will betray me. The Son of Man will go, just as it's written about him, 
But woe to that man who betrays the Son of Man. It would have been better for him if he, were not, if he had not been born. Then Judas, the one who would betray him, said, Surely not I, Rabbi. Jesus answered, Yes, yes, it's you. While they were eating, Jesus took bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and offered it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood, the covenant, which is poured out for the forgiveness of sins, for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. The Last Supper, the Passover, it takes place in a certain place and get this room from a certain man. It kind of sounds like the triumphal entry. Remember that? Where Jesus said to his disciples, go see a certain guy and get the donkey and the, and the colt and tell him the master has need. The same kind of arrangement here. Jesus has a plan that he's executing. They get into this upper room and they're reclining and Jesus says and looks around at his boys and says, one of you is going to betray me. Because the truth is, betrayal is in all our hearts. Notice that when Jesus is being asked by all the disciples, they say, Lord, is it I? Is it I? Then when Judas asks, he doesn't call him Lord. He said, Rabbi, is it me? It changes the word. You see, Judas didn't identify Christ as his Lord, just as a teacher. He may have been in it for the money, but Jesus says, yes, it's you. One of the other Gospels tells us that immediately at that time, Judas gets up and he goes out into the night. So when Jesus is instituting the Last Supper, or the Lord's Supper here, Judas is not there. We read in 1 Corinthians 11, where Paul repeats this idea of breaking bread and drinking the cup to remember Jesus. So Jesus takes the Passover and turns it into a memorial service for himself until he comes. At the end, it says they sing a hymn and then they go out. The last psalm of the Hillel that is sung at this feast is Psalm 118. Psalm 118. Listen to the words that Jesus sang as he was going out into the garden of Gethsemane and then to be betrayed. This is what Jesus sang. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever. Let Israel say, his love endures forever. Let the house of Aaron say, his love endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord say, his love endures forever. When hard pressed, I cried to the Lord and he brought me into a spacious place. What can mere mortals do to me? The Lord is with me, he is my helper. I look in triumph on my enemies. That's what Jesus sang on the night he was about to go be betrayed. What are you and I like when we face trials? We're in the crucible of life and things get tough. Do we think about the great love of God whose mercy endures forever? Or are we more consumed with other things? See, Jesus was reveling in his Father's love. Jesus then predicts Peter's denial. Then Jesus told them, this very night you will all fall away on account of me. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. Peter replied, even if all fall away on account of you, I never will. I tell you the truth, Jesus answered, this very night before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. But Peter declared, even if I have to die for you, with you, I will never disown, me, disown you. And all the disciples said the same. Jesus is still fulfilling prophecy here. He quotes about the shepherd and the sheep from Zechariah 13. And Peter basically says, Jesus, I don't know about the rest of these guys, but me, I'm the rock. I'm not going to fall away. They may all fall away, but not me. And then he even says, I'm ready to die for you. And he probably meant that right then. But the Lord understands that Peter is going to fail. He expected Peter's failure. He predicted it. But you know what? The fact that the Lord expected Peter's failure didn't stop Jesus from loving Peter. And our failure doesn't stop the Lord from loving us either. 
And now we go to the, the Garden of Gethsemane. Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him. He began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little farther, he fell on his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it's possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Could you not keep watch with me for one hour, he asked Peter. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the body is weak. He went away a second time and prayed, My father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. When he came back, he found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. So he left them, went away once more and prayed the third time, saying the same thing. And then he returned to his disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour is near and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. You know, the, the word Gethsemane means oil press. It's where the olives were pressed to make oil, and Jesus is entering into this time of, of crushing and pressing. He models the importance of prayer, and he takes his inner core with him, Peter, James, and John, and, and says, you know, could you guys, uh, I want you to pray for me and pray with me. And Jesus' human nature is showing, and he's troubled because the weight of the sin is, about, is pressing down on him. Hebrews 4.15 says, We don't have a high priest who's unable to empathize with our weakness, but we have one who's been tempted in every way, just as we are. You see, Jesus understood temptation. He understood the weight of sin. It just wasn't his sin. It was ours. His prayer posture is face down on the ground. When he talks about the cup passing from him, he's talking about the cross. And the contents of that cup were the sins of the world. This isn't, <coughs> this isn't an academic thing. This is reality. This is where Jesus literally has the sins of all people on his shoulders. We read in one of the other Gospels, Luke, Dr. Luke tells us that Jesus sweat great drops of blood being under such psychological stress and physical stress of taking on the sins. And the three guys who were there to support him, they were napping. And Jesus tells them to watch and pray because it's a time of temptation because Satan was there as well. And Jesus' second prayer, I'm willing to drink the cup and may your will be done. The boys are sleeping again, including Peter, the boaster. Jesus wakes them up and basically says, let's do this thing. Makes me ask myself, how committed am I to God's will. You see, Christ was committed to the Father's will. Not my will, but yours be done. Is that the way we approach prayer too? Where we ask God for what he wants, not what we want? Jesus is about to be arrested. and While he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived. With him was a large crowd armed with swords and clubs sent from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one that I kiss is the man. Arrest him. Going at once to Jesus, Judas said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. Jesus replied, Friend, do what you came for. And the men stepped forward, seized Jesus, and arrested him. With that, one of Jesus' companions reached for a sword, drew it out, struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Jesus said, um, put your sword back into its place, Jesus said to him, for all who draw the sword will die by the sword. Do you not think I cannot call on my father and he will at once put on my dis at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? But how then would the scriptures be fulfilled that say it must happen this way? At that time, Jesus said to the crowd, am I leading a rebellion so that you have to come out with swords and clubs to capture me? Every day I sat in the temple courts teaching, but you did not arrest me. But this has all taken place, that the writings of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples deserted him and fled. 
you know, I'm really impressed with this wood. This is a wood carving from 1754 representing Judas betraying Christ. The emotion of that is, is amazing. And here's Jesus out with a crowd of armed men and Judas comes in, betrays him with a kiss. And again, Judas calls him rabbi. And you notice what Jesus said, calls him? He calls him friend. We learn in, in John 18 that it's Peter who's the one who takes defensive action, striking off the ear of Malchus, whom Jesus heals. Jesus is not defenseless, is what he tells his, his guys. I could call 12 legions of angels. A Roman legion is 6,000. Using that as a measure, Jesus could call 72,000 angels for his assistance. He's not helpless. This is all going according to prophecy and the plan of God. And as Jesus predicted, all of the disciples run away. Notice how Jesus deals with betrayal. How do we deal with betrayal in our own lives? Do we understand that in all situations, God is our defender? Let's go on. Then, all, then those who had arrested Jesus took him to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the teachers of the law and the elders had assembled. But Peter followed him at a distance, right up to the courtyard of the high priest. He entered and sat down with the guards to see the outcome. Then the chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for false evidence against Jesus so that they could put him to death. But they did not find any, though many false witnesses came forward. Finally, two came forward and declared, This fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and rebuild it in three days. Then the high priest stood up and said to Jesus, Are you not going to answer? What's this testimony that these men are bringing against you? But Jesus remained silent. The high priest said to him, I charge you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Yes, it is as you say, Jesus replied. But I say to all of you, in the future you will, be see, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, He has spoken blasphemy. Why do we need any more witnesses? Look now, you have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? He is worthy of death, they answered. Then they spit in his face and struck him with their fists. Others slapped him and said, Prophesy to us, Christ, who hit you? This is the first of six different hearings that Jesus has. He has three religious and three civil hearings, all in the course of this evening. According to the laws of the Sanhedrin, it was illegal to meet at night. It was illegal for them to pass sentence the same day that they made an arrest. This is all outrageously illegal and against their rules and customs. The Roman leaders, uh, the Romans are the ones who can execute, not the Jews, and they must ask Rome to do the execution. Notice that Peter is following at a distance, and let me suggest to you that if we're followers of Christ and we follow at a distance, we too will get into trouble. There were no charges that they could bring, even though they had all these false witnesses paraded through. None of these things stuck until two guys talked about the destruction of the temple. Jesus wouldn't even answer that accusation because it was a misquoting of what he said. And finally, Caiaphas, the high priest, charges Jesus under oath of the living God to say, are you the Messiah? Are you the Son of God? You see, Caiaphas understood what Jesus was saying, and so he goes directly at him and asks him the question. Jesus affirms, yes, I am the Messiah, and more. He quotes Daniel's messianic writings and refers to himself as the Son of Man, and then it's over. Caiaphas passes judgment. The abuse begins. The creatures are abusing the Creator. And truly, without Christ... Our natural inclination is to shake our fists at God as well. Then the final movement in this chapter is Peter's denial of Christ. Now Peter was sitting out in the courtyard and a servant girl came to him. You were with Jesus of Galilee, she said. He denied it before them all. I don't know what you're talking about, he said. Then he went out to the gateway where there was another girl who saw him and said to the people there, this fellow was with Jesus of Nazareth. He denied it again with an oath. I don't know the man. And after a little while, those standing there went up to Peter and said, surely you're one of them, for your accent gives you away. Then he began to call down curses on himself, and he swore to them, I don't know the man. Immediately a rooster crowed. 
Then Peter remembered the word Jesus had spoken before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. You know, Peter was right there in the court area. And it's important for us to understand that Peter loved Jesus. He loved Jesus, but he still denied Christ. And you know, many of us live our lives like that. We love the Lord, and at different times we deny Christ too. Jesus still loved him, and he's following at a distance, which is a huge mistake. There's temptation that's there. And Peter was so close, he could hear the testimony. Maybe he could have even offered differing testimony. And at the first time, it, he doesn't really deny Christ the first time as much as he evades it. You know, it's, no, that's, and then the second time, his oath was stronger, and he, he emphasizes the truth of his lie with his vehemence. Don't we do that too sometimes when we're caught in a lie? We, we protest really vehemently so that it looks like our, our, our lie is, is covered up. And then thirdly, his speech, his accent betrays us. Sometimes my words or your words might betray us as well. Peter calls down curses on himself as God is my witness. And right then the rooster crows. It triggers the memory of what Jesus said. And in Luke 22, it says, The Lord turned and looked right at Peter. Can you imagine how brokenhearted Peter must have been? to hear the rooster crowing and seeing Jesus look at him, understanding that he had betrayed his Lord. He was brokenhearted as he denied the Lord. So it seems like in this chapter 26, there are three major players other than Jesus. The first one was Mary, who gave all that she had. She was totally sold out for Jesus. She broke her alabaster jar, released that perfume, and gave all she had. Then there was Judas. Seems like he was in it for the money from the beginning. He sold out totally the opposite way for money. When he realized what he had done, Scripture tells us that he took his own life. And how ironic is it that Judas is taking his own life while Christ is laying down his life for many. And then lastly, it's Peter, who follows at a distance. He wanted to be fully committed, but he failed. Later, he was restored and re-energized in his faith. Which one of those are you? Are you fully sold out like Mary? Do you have no interest at all in Jesus and won't call him your Lord like Judas? Are you a struggler like Peter, following from a distance, needing to be re-energized in your life? Pray today that reading through Matthew 26 would challenge us to follow Jesus more closely in all that we do. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for the power in your word. Would you help us today, tonight and tomorrow, to not follow you at a distance, Lord, but to be totally sold out for you. Thank you that you went to the cross for us. Thank you that you had us in mind. Help us to love you more fully today and beyond, we ask. Amen.